Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the fourth quarter 2019 Live Oak Bank Shares Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Greg Seward, General Counsel of Live Oak Bank Shares. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Live Oak's fourth quarter 2019 earnings conference call. We are webcasting live over the Internet, and this call is being recorded. To access the call over the Internet and review the presentation materials and commentary that we reference on the call, please visit our website at investorliveoakbank.com and go to today's call on our event calendar for supporting materials. Our fourth quarter earnings release is also available on our website. Before we get started, I would like to caution you that we may make forward-looking statements during today's call that are subject to risks and uncertainties. Factors that may cause actual results to differ materially from our expectations are detailed in the materials accompanying this call and in our SEC filings. We do not undertake to update the forward-looking statements to reflect the impact of circumstances or events that may arise after the date of today's call. Information about any non-GAAP financial measures reference, including reconciliation of those measures to GAAP measures, can also be found in our SEC filings. I will now turn the call over to Chip Mahan, our Chairman and Chief Executive Officer. Thanks, Greg, and good morning, all. So I'm going to kick off today's call and reflect on our accomplishments over the last four years, discuss our excitement about this year, and then we're going to have some fun and put ourselves in your shoes and discuss our views of the Community Bank of the future versus other bank stocks you can own. Then Neil's going to explain how we're going to accomplish this from a technical standpoint before Huntley takes us home on the bank's financial performance in 2019. Moving to slide three. Whereas uh, we're tickled to death with this year's results, here at Live Oak we often refer to marathons and not sprints. It was fun for us to go back and reflect on our first full year as a public company. 2016 that was, so beginning in 2016 we grew assets almost five-fold until the end of this year the capital account over doubled from 200 million to over 530 million. Recurring dependable revenue quadrupled from about 40 million dollars to almost 170, while non-interest expense was up 130 percent in the four-year period. Oh, by the way, and along the way, we originated $7 billion of mostly government guarantee loans. We sold $3 billion to avoid dilution and charged off just $14 million in four years compared to adding almost $55 million to the loan loss reserve. Moving to slide four, we're proud to show this slide every quarter. The loan portfolio grew 43%. Credit quality improved. Net interest income was up 32%. And most importantly, we grew the government guaranteed book from $357 million to almost a billion dollars. Uh, as a shareholder, you should use, view that as a credit quality buffer. We were excited uh, to continue to grow that this quarter, about $90 million, which was off a bit. USDA was, was behind a little bit this quarter. And as we think about originations in the future, we're happy that we originated about $2 billion of loans in 19. And we think that would rather increase 10 plus percent in 2020. Moving on to slide five, another recurring earnings call slide, and the beat goes on. So this quarter we hung on to $269 million in high quality loans. The spread was a bit less as we suffered a couple of down uh, rate challenges there, as we all know. So we uh, Put a nickel, a share uh, EPS on the books this quarter when annualized at 20 cents. Last quarter was 25 cents. So we charge on to a buck a share of wonderful recurring EPS. Moving on to slide six, the credit quality slide. Again, um, good news on safety and soundness. Charge offs were a million dollars less in 19 than 18. That's 3.8 million versus 4.8. Non-performers as a percent of Tier 1 capital in the loan loss reserve declined to 3.6% in line with our historical norms. And this is a bit frustrating. It's rumored out there that you people talk. And uh, there is talk that your number one SBA lender in the country will lead the league when a recession occurs. 
I'm here to tell you today that that could not be further from the truth. Until Cecil, we typically went into each vertical, and the theory of verticality reigns. So we used SBA's historic loss ratio for all their banks, and at the end of four years, we drew it up with our actual losses. In so doing, we added back $12 million over the last four or five years to the loan loss reserve doing it this way. This will no longer be the case in the future uh, with Cecil, and Steve Smith, our chief credit officer, is here this morning, and he can certainly talk about that in the Q&A here shortly. Now, you know, in preparing for this uh, call, uh, I tried to put, we try to put ourselves in your shoes. So you only have three options today. You're consuming data, and you're trying to decide whether you're going to buy more live oak shares, sell live oak shares, or hold on to what you got. So what would be your alternative? So we did some work on the traditional community bank and whether you want to buy that stock or hold on to ours. So let's talk a little bit about the bank of the future versus the past. So in preparation for this call, again, had some fun and looked at 15 investor presentations of banks roughly our value, of banks that traded between 140 a tangible book and 180 of tangible book. And for those of you that are professional bank stock analysts, shocking, shocking, all investor presentations were exactly the same. There was a little map of the location of offices. Section 2 talked about a diversified loan portfolio, single-family residential, think real estate, CRE, think real estate, multifamily, real estate again, construction and land development, real estate, some CNI loans, very little consumer from a dollar standpoint. Then we had to go to the deposit mix, lower cost of funds, back to the branches. So if you go to slide nine, and in the tiny font that you can't read, there are 10 banks represented here. They had an average number of almost 40 branches. They had 250 people more than we do, roughly the same net interest margin, very little discussion on the cost to operate those branches, which we estimate between 1% and 2%, which would need to be a deduct for that 363. Fantastic. Let's focus on the rubber really meets the road. So you have a real estate play in a geographic area with a traditional community bank, and you're paying 160 a book for that company versus 144 a book for our company. And we grow at almost seven times their rate in a diverse high-quality asset, what that Huntley's going to describe later. Now let's, let's, let's talk about the state of play today and maybe the state of play tomorrow. So earlier this week, Penny Crossman from the American Banker uh, interviewed Adam Dell, who's the founder and CEO of Clarity Money, bought by Goldman. And this gentleman runs the Goldman Marcus product. And she says, in several recent article headlines, it is reported you say banks are screwed. Did that come out a little stronger than you intended? Adam says, yes, the text of my comments were not relayed in the press. My comment really was around the notion of the empowerment of the consumer and how important it is that banks appreciate the greed to which the consumer is now empowered to understand the value they are getting from their financial relationship. Historically, if you're an average consumer in the U.S., it is very difficult to understand the fees that you pay to your bank, the interest rate they pay you for deposits. That lack of transparency is a thing of the past, in that consumers now have a wide array of tools available to them to understand the financial arrangement they have with their bank. And then he goes on to say, and I just love this, love it, Inertia is the most harming of the ailments that face the consumer who is failing to address financial well-being. Now, this is consumer-focused. We're small business-focused. But if you move to slide 10, so what is the state of play today, right? So if you look at the box at the bottom and you think about a small business and you think about a veterinarian, and we do business with a 1,000 of them, she has a checking account most likely a money market account or a savings account. She probably funds her business with a personal credit card or maybe a business credit card. And if she's lucky, 
She has a line of credit from her bank. So let's unpack that. How do we as an industry, how do those banks that you have an opportunity to pay 160 a book for versus us at 140 a book? Well, on the checking account, kind of screw her, Adam's words, monthly fees, transaction fees, NSF fees, wire fees. B of A pays three bips on a savings account. We pay 200 bips. Credit cards are always 18%. Line of credit, who knows? All these systems are run separately, and they don't talk to each other. Neil is going to describe how in a next-gen core processing, system, core processing system with our ecosystem, we can bring this all together in one account. So at the end of the day, to Dr. So-and-so, if you have zero to $5,000, we might not pay you anything. Five to 15, we might pay you 1%. Over 25, we might pay you 2%. <clears throat> and if you need to borrow, we're not going to lend it to you at 8, 18%. We're going to be fair. I know, yes, there'll be cash back and rewards and all those sort of things. And if, in fact, we can do that, understanding that only 2% of small businesses move their checking account today, our research indicates that with this account, it might be substantially higher. Might we bring our cost of funds down substantially? 25 bits? 50 bits, 75 bits on a $5 billion bank, that's meaningful. Neil, take over. Thanks, Chip. Uh, to your point, as, as you've been following the Live Oak Bank journey, you know that one of our core themes <coughs> centers around financial services technology. This next slide is a reminder of our fintech investing over the years, and as you can see, we've been pretty busy. From the spin-out of Encino to the joint venture with Aperture to Live Oak Ventures in assembling strategics, investing in mission-critical banking applications, we feel Live Oak Bank is on the forefront of digital transformation. We're excited to announce our journey continues in this latest endeavor, Canopy, which you might have read about, a fintech venture fund built by bankers for bankers. Turning on to the next slide, this close to $600 million fintech fund is unique in that the limited partners are highly progressive banks who are deeply interested in understanding the fintech landscape. LPs include 30 regional and super regional banks as well as the ABA and the ICBA. While we think this is a major milestone for the industry, the benefits of Lavos Bank are significant. In addition to fee-based income connected to the fund, it also receives carry, which comes with the long-term harvesting of a fund. But even more strategically, we get to see every fintech deal in the market with unprecedented clarity, and we feel this will keep Live Oak Bank on the leading edge of digital transformation. Turning the page on to the numbers, as you can see, we've broken up the fintech activities into three buckets for greater clarity, Aperture, Live Oak Ventures, and Canopy. Given our ownership and Aperture, we follow equity method accounting. And while we do not consolidate Aperture, our pro rata portion of the losses, losses do flow through our income state. As you can see, we're investing heavily in the platform and will continue to invest in 2020. At Live Oak Ventures, we had a relatively neutral year, year where write-ups of one company's valuation offset the flow-through losses of the others. We feel this neutrality will continue in 2020 and beyond. And lastly, at Canopy, we're excited. Given the fund's approval in Q4, we began to receive fee-based income, which will continue through the fund's 10-year existence. This is an offset to expenses that already existed in the business and will be a net positive to the income statement. So moving on to the next slide and connecting it to CHIP's one-account concept, why would we go through all this pain over the years investing, incubating companies, starting funds? It really takes a ton of energy. And to us, it's quite simple. It all comes down to the customer. The customer now demands more superior uh, customer journey and digital journey, and this is demonstrated by the millions of customers flocking to fintechs. Sadly, we feel the banking sector is broken and old soft, with old software and old tools, and somebody has to fix it. Why not us? So as you can see by this picture, we've deconstructed the entire stack, created, incubated, and invested in an entirely new approach with new companies. And this has been difficult, and yes, it's taken longer than we've expected. But the platform will last for decades to come and allow us to bring new products to the market, just like the one account that Chip referred to earlier. In addition, this scrappy approach has had little effect on our income statement. If anything, we've benefited from the write-ups associated with our equity investments over the years. And lastly, I am excited to say that after a three-year build, including an entirely new core uh, ecosystem, we're rolling out first products with limited availability this quarter and general, general availability next quarter. And certainly, we'd invite you to open up a new account as we feel the experience will set the new standard. Huntley, over to you. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Chip. <clears throat> Turning to the uh, the bank, 
on slide 17. And we're extremely proud of the accomplishments of the bank this past year, which is a direct result of the dedication of our entire team. And Q4 really punctuated uh, just a great overall year. We knew that by holding more of our loans on our balance sheet, we'd reduce our near-term earnings, but that it would result in a stronger franchise. As you can see, over the course of the year, we grew our loan portfolio by over 40% and ended the year with a balance sheet of $4.8 billion. We stayed true to our strategy of holding 65% of our government guarantee the came of our sale. Our net income grew 30% year despite three rate cuts during the year. And we remain disciplined on the expense side despite providing over $2 billion of credit to over 1,100 small businesses nationwide and working to build the next generation of technology and banking. On slide 18, the lending franchise was strong across the board last year with our $2 billion of origination spread across geography and industry. As you can see, our more established verticals continue to perform well, and the newer verticals are maturing nicely. Overall, small business activity remained solid throughout the year, despite SBA volumes being down industry-wide. In the SBA space, in 7A lending, we're proud once again to be the nation's largest SBA lender this year, extending our lead in that category. It's a testament to our model, which combines deep vertical expertise, an efficient technology platform, and the dedication of our people to serve the nation's small business owners and entrepreneurs. We also ended the year on top of the USDA lending list, which is an area where we continue to see a lot of opportunity, especially with some of the changes in the recent Farm Bill. As Chip mentioned, growth in the guarantee portfolio slowed a bit in the fourth quarter as we originated less renewable energy in the quarter, which is really more a timing issue than anything else. We're also methodically looking up market at opportunities to lend beyond our traditional government programs. A lot of people talk about the lower middle market, which seems like an increasingly competitive space to us. But we think there's a lot of opportunity in the upper little market, targeting companies and industries we understand with typically less than $5 million in EBITDA. While this strategy will modestly increase our average loan size, we aren't going to compromise our commitment to diversification and granularity across the portfolio. For perspective, we still have no loans over $20 million in exposure and only a handful over 10. Overall, we continue to see great lending opportunities across our 33 verticals, and our pipeline remains robust. On slide 19, we show our existing $3.6 billion loan portfolio and the diversification of it as well. 45% is government guarantee, as Chip mentioned, which we think serves as a great source of contingent capital and liquidity. It's also worth noting is the $3 billion of loans that we service for others that puts our managed loan portfolio over $6.5 billion. Over time, we expect to replace the majority of those loans with loans on our balance sheet as we continue to work with our existing borrowers more proactively to keep them on our books. Turning to credit, overall our loan portfolio continues to perform very well and in line with our expectations, as Chip mentioned. Non-performing loans and charge-offs were both slightly improved on the quarter, and the watch list was basically flat. We remain guardedly optimistic in this late-cycle economy, and while we aren't seeing any macro deterioration in the portfolio, we are cautious, especially in places where competitive pressure is high, like the craft beverage industry, or where there are more cyclical concerns, like hospitality. The obligatory CECL comment, uh, as Chip mentioned, you know, while the new methodology is certainly more sophisticated and it's more weighted towards quantitative factors, we expect our allowance uh, to stay roughly the same relative historic levels. Um, and it largely leverages our existing models that we have in place uh, that use, you know, SBA data and then migrating towards, you know, our own, our own data. On the funding side, on page 21, our direct deposit model continues to perform extremely well. Growth was in line with our expectations and our balance sheet needs for the quarter. Average balances were up about $200 million in total deposits and 500 and 1,500 new retail accounts, which brings our total to right at 50,000 retail accounts. Our digital platform remains highly scalable. As we've said in the past, the lower cost to operate translate to higher rates for customers, which leads to better customer acquisition. And there seems to be plenty of room for growth as the leading players in the space are many multiples larger than we are. Overall, the market for online savings and CDs has remained rational. Most of the major digital banks remain within 10 to 15 basis points of each other. On the savings side, Fed rate, the Fed cut rates three times in the back half of the year, and we've repriced our savings down a total of 45 basis points. We're still enjoying extremely low savings uh, attrition rates, and CD renewals are running all over 70%. With a stable Fed outlook, customer preference has shifted more towards CDs, which is good for us as we have $800 million of CDs rolling over in the first quarter, with an average rate rolling off of about 255 and rolling on at about 205 
So about 50 basis points of pickup there. Turning to the net interest income on slide 22, net interest income grew nicely over the year despite three rate cuts in the back half of the year. Two of those cuts hit our loan book in Q4, causing NII to be roughly flat for the quarter despite uh, almost 7% uh, linked quarter increase in earning assets. Those rate cuts compressed our NIM to 355 for the quarter. Despite the continued competitive lending environment, loan spreads remained roughly flat during the quarter on our new loan production. Looking forward, we expect margins to be roughly flat in Q1, with the Q4 rate cut offset largely by CD rollover, and the margin should trend up modestly from there over the course of 2020, assuming constant rate environment. As we mentioned, we stayed true to our targets this year and sold roughly one-third of the government guaranteed loans that became available for sale. As we typically sell all of our USDA production given the long fixed rate nature of the product, that means we sold only about a quarter of our eligible SBA loans. As the secondary market for 7A loans continued to strengthen throughout the year, we've continued to evaluate our hold versus sell decision and decided to make a slight revision to our targets. Going forward, we'll continue to sell virtually all of our USDA production and target a third of our eligible SBA production. The effect will be relatively modest, but we'll look to capitalize on the strong market and conserve a little bit more capital in the process. On slide 24, you know, Chip, ref Chip referenced the growth in the company since the IPO. At that point, the servicing asset was over a quarter of the capital base of the company, and the resulting earnings volatility was significant. Today, we sit with the servicing asset at 6.6% of capital, and the impact of a quarterly revaluation is a fraction of what it used to be. We're getting close to the point where new production will offset the amortization, and we expect the asset to stabilize in size as we go forward, but continue to decline as a percent of capital and earnings as we grow. On the expense side, we're really pleased with the story last year, especially relative to our growth in clients and balance sheet. Normalizing for the performance bonuses, expenses increased less than 5% year over year. While the fourth quarter saw an unusually large FDIC insurance assessment, it was offset by a reduction in some of our professional services costs, largely with the completion of Canopy. We did increase our lending teams by about 25 people over the course of last year, which we expect to help drive continued lending growth in 2020. Given we knew we were managing this pivot year in earnings, we delayed some hiring until the end of the year, so we'll see a bit of a higher run rate in 2020 in the expense side, but we'll still see a significant operating leverage and we'll continue to remain focused on balancing expense discipline with investing to support the growth of our franchise. So summing it all up, we've shown this slide every quarter of the year, and we'll continue to, because you can see the progress we've made over the course of the year across the key metrics we're looking at. In 2020, we'll continue on the same course, focusing on providing capital to small business owners, the doers of the economy. And with continued momentum in our core banking franchise, we'll continue to focus on our future technology build and delivering a new broad suite of products across the next generation infrastructure. With that, Chip or Neil, we can open up for questions. Let's do it. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star one on your telephone. To which all your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Jennifer Dimba of SunTrust. Your line is now open. Thank you. Good morning. Morning, Jennifer. Hi. Um, so you said you um, are pretty optimistic on the economy and credit quality, but you, you're being a little bit more cautious on hospitality and craft beverage. Can you kind of expand on those thoughts? Hey, Jennifer. This is Steve Smith. Happy to. Um, yeah, again, we're looking at uh, those are two examples of industries that we've got our eye on, um, how competition, for example, may impact the craft uh, beverage space, making sure that, um, you know, if it's impacting their revenues. And really, it's about just remaining disciplined in our credit decisions. You know, businesses have to have solid plans. Um, and then we look closely at contingencies um, that the business has to deal with unexpected bumps. You know, balance sheet strength, cash on the balance sheet, a proven ability to raise equity when it's needed, global support. Uh, so just remaining very disciplined on that front. Hospitality, again, um, seasonality. Uh, so where we focus on is, is strong projects, um, very disciplined loan to values. Um, almost our entire portfolio, our loan to values are less than 65%. 
I would say across the entire portfolio, our weighted loan to value um, is about 40 to 45 percent. So we're very disciplined, very conservative uh, in that space. Have you seen any credit deterioration in either one of those loan buckets? Uh, nothing that rises to grave concern. We've seen a handful of uh, beer uh, businesses that have had, are missing their mark on their planned revenue growth, and that's due to you know competition. Uh, most of those are smaller credits, very manageable, um, and we're taking a very like we do. Um, take a very proactive approach to dig into their plans and, and see what they're doing around that. But um, nothing uh, that I would call a macro concern, but there are, you know, examples of on a micro level of businesses that are struggling a little bit to ramp up, and we're keeping a close eye on that. Okay. Um, Huntley, you said expense control would continue to be a focus. Um, what What's your thought on hiring this year in terms of more producers? You said you might go up market a little bit. And, yeah. um, you know, as you look at the mix of loan growth over the next couple of years, how do you see it evolving? Um, you know, 24% of your originations last year were were conventional. How do you see that mix evolving over time? Sure. I think we largely have the lending team on the field that we want right now, and we're in like you know a bunch of great verticals. The generalist team is hitting their stride in a bunch of great markets, um, and so if we you know pick up one or two here and there, uh, maybe. But I don't think you'll see us grow uh, the lending side to the same extent that we did uh, last year. And we really uh, really love the team that we've got right now. Um, you know, in terms of the mix. You know, look, we look at, we'll make all the great 7 eight loans that we can find, and we'll continue to, to chase those. I think just generally with the relative size, the opportunity set for us in conventional is larger um, than it is in 7A. We do still think there's a lot on the USDA front that we can still do uh, as we broaden out across all of the different uh, programs, uh, you know, that they offer. And so we, we still think there's more upside in the USDA side. Um, I think more of your incremental growth is likely to come uh, from the uh, from the conventional side, though. They're also a little bit larger credit, so they'll move the needle a little bit more on a relative basis. Okay. And, um, Neil, I think you said you were rolling out the new deposit product very soon here? Yeah, look, as I, I, I said that, it takes longer. Uh, I'm thinking of you because I've had to um, field your questions on the checking account uh, many times. You know, rolling out the core in a, in a banking environment takes uh, just took us more time than we expected. So uh, what we're rolling out in Q1 is CD and savings, onboarding and servicing, uh, and, you know, that's 80%. We're, 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 and then we're very close to the checking account thereafter. I'd rather not give you a date on the checking account, but know that a brand new web, mobile, onboarding, servicing, CD savings, personal and business uh, offering is coming up. Limited availability in Q1 and general availability Q2. Okay. So the checking account sounds like it's probably the second half of the year event. I think that's right. Fair? That's right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Aaron Deer of Piper Sandler. Your line is now open. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Aaron. Um, it, pardon me if I if you covered this. I, I got on the call late, but Neil, following up on the um, on your discussion there, um, the there was a drop in the data processing cost. I'm wondering is that tied to the core conversion that you mentioned, and is that um, are we at a, a sustainable run rate on data processing, or are there other investments happening there that's going to cause that number to come back up? Yeah, I think I think so. I, so I think it's I think I'm turn it over to Brett relative to that specifically. I, I think we one. I don't know that we've actually seen the benefit of the core conversion and and the uh, financial uh, impact there yet. So good news is there's probably more uh, upside. Keynes, what would you say? That yeah, means? on the data processing side, Aaron, uh, you know, looking at Q4, uh, I would say that's more of a change in some of the uh, uh, third-party services we were using. Um, there was. Uh, some internal uh, build-out uh, that we were doing, 
and that did not repeat in Q4 um, or came to completion in Q3. Okay, and then um, also related to um, to the uh, the discussion on the deposit um, products being introduced, um, it, is that it, does the margin guidance that you provided in terms of um, some stability here um, in the in the first quarter and then some expansion as the year goes on. Does that incorporate the expectation for um, the deposit flows from these new products or could good success in those products drive even more expansion on the margin? Um, well, I think certainly, this is Brett, I think certainly um, success there um, would lead to uh, uh, upside uh, from a margin standpoint. Um, you know, I do think there's a uh, there's a there's a rollout period uh, for when we have the ability um, uh, to go after the, those deposits. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking 2020, um, favorability there is probably going to be muted um, as volumes of those types of accounts build. But our but our margin guidance that we just talked about doesn't have any benefit embedded in it. Yeah, it's steady state, no. and there's upside. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then. Um, uh, Brett, any um, I, I obviously, guys have pulled back on the um, on the uh, solar tax investments and the, the related credits there. Um, if you didn't already, could you give a um, an update on your expectations for where the tax rates likely to shake out here heading into 2020? Yes. Uh, well, I guess uh, for starters, uh, you know, we're, we continue to look heavily at investment tax credits through solar panel leasing. Um, as everyone knows, that's something that uh, we uh, did a, a good bit of in 2018 and also early in 2019. Pulled back a little bit because of some of the economics. Uh, however, we're starting to see trends um, where that could turn favorable again. Uh, so still looking at it heavily. Uh, it'll probably be uh, an update we give later on in the year. Uh, but for now, um, I think as far as your modeling is concerned, uh, something similar to what we experienced in Q4 um, is a good run rate going forward, kind of in that uh, 25%, uh, percent, um, or just above 25% effective tax rate. Okay, great. Thanks for taking my questions. Okay. Thank, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude our question and answer session. I would now like to turn the call back over to Chip Mahan, Chairman and CEO, for any closing remarks. Uh, we just thank everyone for attending, and we'll see you 90 days from now. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.